Hey, y'all, welcome to Geek Freaks. I am Frank, and today I'm with Nick Roth, TV writer, filmmaker, here to talk about Hanky Panky. How are you doing today? I'm doing, if I'm being honest, uh, my my balls are really sore from a vasectomy <laughs> a few days ago. I was going to say, I'm doing great. I'm not. My balls hurt. Uh, I, I have small children, so I'm tired. I am tired, and my balls physically hurt. That is how yeah. I am doing today. How are you? I'm doing okay. And you also have a kid just off mic. So get ready for the noises, guys. Yeah. That's how life is. <laughs> you got mac and cheese and strawberries. Like, I don't know what else. I know that's the best I can do. Yeah, that is solid. Uh, but let's go ahead and talk about Hanky Panky. We're going to talk about you here in a little bit. But first, can you give us a rundown of what is Hanky Panky? It's a movie. It's a real movie, despite what anybody tells you. It's a film. <laughs> a cinema film. Uh, <laughs> it's a... It's a very zany, silly comedy horror movie that pits a talking handkerchief uh, against an intergalactic, evil, brain-eating, soul-sucking top hat, voiced by Seth Green. And, uh, of course, uh, I mean, why not? <laughs> because because that who else? And uh, and uh, it's uh, it's now streaming on Tubi and anywhere else that you do VOD or anything like that. Yeah, so uh, you could stream it on Tubi with ads, but if you guys want to purchase it, it's on Apple TV, Prime, Google Play, YouTube, the normal places where you, you spend a few bucks uh, make sure to rent a movie. So check that out. A couple people have bought it on Xbox, on the Xbox Marketplace. You can get, you can get it. It's everywhere. There you go. I never, I didn't think anybody did that anymore. That's cool. <laughs> That's awesome. yeah, did I, but a couple people told me they did. So That's cool. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and uh, talk about you a little bit here. Uh, one of the more unique things that stood out when I started doing my deep dive onto you is that you have this PhD in English from Cornell University. Uh, tell us why you decided to do that and what from that translated into I want to be a filmmaker. Uh, it, well, I, I don't want to go as so far as to say it was a mistake. I don't think it was that <laughs> bad. Uh, I had dubious psychological reasons for wanting to go to grad school and get, I wanted to, I don't know. I probably wanted to prove to my mom I was smart. I don't know if that Classic. worked and found myself in grad school, uh, you know, in the early two, 2010s, I guess, and realizing that the, the academic world wasn't for me. I, I, I like, I wanted to study books and movies and, write about them and read them and understand them more. And, and I did do that. But then at some point I was like, oh, writing these movies would be an awful lot more fun than writing about these movies, yes. books and movies. Um, and so like in 20, that was like 2013, I was like, I made the decision in my head. I'm from LA and like everyone I knew was in the film industry and my parents were in the film industry and stuff. And I was, I had sort of like been running away from my destiny or whatever. And so I, I, about 10 years ago, a little over that, I, I came back to embrace my fate yeah. um, and then spent, you know, the next six or seven years in different assistant gigs until uh, eventually, yeah, sort of slowly climbing up from, from aspiring writer to struggling writer, which I, I think is a good, yeah. Nice. Bump on the on the on the title train. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's a pretty unique take is the fact that you were trying to get away from the entertainment business when so many people moved to LA to try to embrace it. And yeah. you were sitting there. I think I I think I vowed in I may have sworn in blood to never be part of it. I don't know. I broke <laughs> that vow, I guess. Yeah, Yo, you broke it. That's your next movie right there. Um <laughs> Uh, then, yeah, you're so you have your dissertation, uh, Potential Cinema, Closet Film in the 20th Century Fiction. Uh, sounds like a fascinating title. What was this about? What influenced you to, to write this dissertation? Okay, so the, this is if for for academically minded people, they will appreciate this. This, this you know, you, you have to when you write a dissertation, it's like 250 pages. It's got to yeah. be a, an, you have to find an original thing that to write about that no one's ever written about. Seems impossible. Uh, <laughs> and so I stumbled upon that in, in grad school. I was taking a class on melodrama and, mm -hmm. you know, we we're reading a lot of plays and watching some movies. And at some point we were talking about closet, uh, closet drama, which is mm -hmm. uh, an established and very much talked about within academics. Um, it's it's people who are writing things that aren't meant to be plays, but they're writing them as if it was a play. Uh, like it's written in play script format with dialogue. This goes all the way back to like Plato was writing philosophy. Yeah. Like Phaedrus and some of his other works are written as if it was a play, but it's not meant to be performed and it's not really a script, but it's like that. And Milton, yeah. John Milton wrote these in the 17th century. Samson Agonistes is a very famous one. So there's a very long history 
Seneca and Rome. Like there's a thousands of years of people doing this and people talking about it. And I, I think because I was interested in movies and I had come from LA and knew people in the industry, I was the person in that class who was like, does this exist for movies? Is there closet film? Does that, is that a thing? Um, do people have people written things that aren't meant to be movies, but you, but written in them in screenplay format and the professor, Nick Salvato, great guy who eventually was on my committee and helped me with my dissertation. Love him very much. I think he's still at Cornell, um, was like, I don't know the answer to that question. And thus a dissertation topic is born. Whenever you find yeah. when you come up with the question that the professor doesn't know the answer to, that became the, the subject of my, of my research, which was, has this happened and to what extent and how can we answer this? And so, and the answer is no one had written about this extensively. A couple people, well, one guy who became my friend, Quimby Milton, who lived in Huntington Beach, wrote a, an article about this. And then some guy in Japan has written an article about it, and that was it. So now the three of us are the whole field of study. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, and the truth is a lot of people have done this in really interesting ways. There was a, a, a Japanese writer in the twenties who wrote a lot of these kinds of things. He was sort of embracing early silent film. His name is Yunosuke. He's a very famous uh, uh, Japanese modernist author. It's not really known internationally so much, but he's like one of the biggest 20th century writers in Japan. Yeah. And uh, he wrote, it turned out a bunch of these things. He wrote novellas and short stories, but then in the twenties, there were all these people who were made, who had these like film scenarios because they were silent film. They didn't have dialogue. Uh, and he was like, I'm going to start writing poems and stories that use this form. And then also in, in France in the twenties, people were doing this, the French surrealists. A lot of them were really interested in movies. They tried to make movies. They did a really bad job making movies. They made very few movies. It's hard to make them. So they actually, then they wrote things called, they called them cine poems uh, or cine roman, a sort of movie book. They like, there's a lot of experimenting with this form. And then, yeah. you know, later people, there's this really interesting guy. He's still around. His name is Darius James. He's like a, performance artist and a, a voodoo practitioner and an experimental oh, wow. writer he wrote a novel in the form of a script but it's 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 a novel but yeah. written in the script it's called negrophobia an urban parable a novel it's yeah. amazing it's crazy it's unfilmable it has you know all kinds of things but it's written as if it was a screenplay yeah um and so th there are examples from sort of you know, throughout the last hundred years or so of people sort of just messing around with like, I want to write a poem. I want to write a novel. I want to write something that, but use screenplay formatting and make it have that. What does that do to like how we think about how we read and whether we see a movie in our head as we read and, and questions like that. Right. But that was what, that was what my research was about. Um, which was more or less because it was like, oh, here's a, this is a thing that's a worthwhile question in academia that no one else is, or almost nobody else is asking. No one had written anything substantial yeah. on on the topic. So, so well, I immediately my mind's racing with ideas of like, uh, why do this? Is, is it easier to then picture the scenario in your mind than it is in a regular novel or something like that? There's all kinds of different yeah. reasons for that. Very interesting. There's a lot of really interesting hypothetical stuff. Like, why aren't, I mean, why aren't more people doing it is, is one question because yeah. it, it's been done so much with, with plays. Like uh, one of the chapters of James Joyce's Ulysses is written as if it was a play. That's a clause yeah. that it's talked about. Like this is, the, there are lots of instances. There are relatively few instances of people doing this with movies. And there's, and it, it's it partly just because like film scripts haven't really been embraced as literary in the same way that I think plays are. They're not studied that way, but it raises an interesting question of like, why not? Yeah, and there is a, a very big community, especially in yeah. like the geekdom of movies being novelized, especially like you think of Star Wars or whatever. Uh, and then they usually add details that weren't necessarily in the movie. And so it would be interesting to see how those two correlate. Like, what are you adding in sure. when you do it this way? What do you? What's worth taking out when you go the other way? That's very interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's all like it's there's interesting. There's another another interesting parallel is like the storyboard, which in some cases mm -hmm. is very similar to a graphic novel or a comic book. Right. And like right. but the storyboard never gets. Or 
rarely, unless it's like a big movie with it's really doing promotional stuff, like does that get published, right? And then yeah. we get to look at that in the same way that it's like, you know, when we talk about theater or plays, it's like most people read plays and study them, not necessarily even having seen them, right? Like you can be a Shakespeare person and just read them. You don't have to actually play them plays right i mean yeah. partly that's just because it's harder to like a play has to be staged for you to see it in a movie you you, you are expected to have this text and talk about it right but mm -hmm. um certainly when you put like a play script next to a screenplay for a movie i mean they're the formatting is slightly different but not significant yeah so then you get you know you decide hey i want to be a filmmaker someday i want to be a tv writer how do you pull that information that you gathered that is quite unique you're one of three in a field how do you pull yeah. that into your your career mostly didn't i mean like okay. the experiences that i had in grad school are formative for a lot of reasons but it's not like i was able to i didn't take a lot of like practical i mean grad school is mostly about I will say this: grad school did help me with pitching as a as a writer because it, it's it's a lot of bullshit. It's a lot of yeah. like how convincing. Can I swear on this podcast? Yeah, of course, of course. Great. Right. Uh, it's a lot of bullshit. It's a lot yeah. of convincing people you know what you're talking about, and everyone has to be an expert on a thing. And like it is rigorous training in the art of bullshit. And I do think that that is a skill that, in some cases, in television writing and in you know pitching projects and movies and stuff. You do. I am better at sounding like I know what I'm talking about than I than I am, than I actually know. Right. Uh, that's useful. Yeah. But I, I and I read a lot in grad school and I think that's helpful in my writing. But like other than that, it's not like there was a lot that was specific to this very esoteric project. Yeah. It's so niche. I was writing mostly about authors that most of the authors no one had ever heard of. Uh, and then sometimes I'd be like, oh, William Burroughs wrote one of these. I can write a little bit about that because at least he's like, a, like a, that's great. He's a name. But like yeah. Darius James was not really a name. I was able to go. If I went, I took a train down to I was in upstate New York at the time. I took a train to Yale. Uh, he was living in New Haven and like he hung out with me and we got a beer and I was able to talk to him and stuff like he was very approachable. He's a nice guy. We sort of kept up a, a bit of a friendship. He was he did come out to L.A. trying to make actual movies and then he ruined the whole thing for me because it was like i would love if someone made this into a movie and i was like no the whole point it's lit it can't you can't i wrote a, i wrote a dissertation chapter just about how this is unfilmable in really interesting yeah. ways and he was like no i think it is and i was like yeah, coen brothers have got it <laughs> it's like no 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 <laughs> so so i don't know like, what do i know i did so it's not like the it's not like the stuff that i was writing in that is very practical in any in any way it did get me i did have a i was a up for a job one of my first jobs as a writer's pa mostly just getting coffee for writers um apparently i did find out later it was like it was between me and one other person and the showrunner of the show had been like it was between me and a woman she was like okay hire the woman and, I, and then she was like unless is there anything particularly hilarious about the the male candidates resume and her yeah. assistant was like he has a phd in english she was like that's funny yeah. hire him <laughs> so I got me a oh, job. No. it's it's terrible that phd is the joke <laughs> like he's I a mean, writer but he's got a phd there's a comedy there's a comedy show they needed they needed it to be funny yeah i was, <laughs> I was dr pa on that show oh that's great oh yeah you aren't you a doctor in this one too on in hanky panky so so the character excellent segue the character okay. of dr crane you know, is he's a lot of things he's based on a lot of things. And, and one of the a lot of it was me drawing on the sort of the end of an era of my life, the end of a chapter of me as an academic in my life. I got a big bookworm tattooed on my ribs and stuff and made fun of myself yeah. a lot. And Dr. Crane is sort of like the most bombastic, over the top academic, pretentious, full of himself version of myself as a phd and as a you know as, as kind of that guy right and also you know drawn on some people i've met in my academic travels who are kind of that absurd yeah yeah somebody who feels like they should be in a murder mystery that's like kind of try to give you a hint <laughs> as they're talking to you <laughs> yeah are you, um, no, no, but, uh, so speaking uh with with hanky panky it's a crazy unique idea uh even the elevator pitch i'm sure it would be hard to get off and luckily you had practice with pitching things um where did you come up with this idea where did this come from you know we no one can remember i've been talking a lot since we finished the movie yeah uh you know Lindsay 
who is my wife and co-director, Lindsay Pollan, who plays Rebecca, and Toby Bryan, who plays Norm. He voices Woody. He did the puppets. The yeah. three of us have tried to remember, but can't remember. Who came up with the hat? <laughs> like, why... Yeah. Why is there a killer top hat? Why is that the foil to our talking napkin? We all sort of dis. No one really wants to maybe take the blame for it. I don't know. We can't. I, I, I literally don't. I wish I had an answer for this and I should probably just make one up. But it was just one of those crazy things where it was like most of this film came out of. What are the pieces that we have and how can we make it? Because we just wanted to make a movie. We're a group yeah. of friends like this. There's no company here. There's no no one hired anybody. No one. Like, this was just like, we are a very close, small group of friends and family who are like, let's make a feature film because yeah. I think we can. And I think we can make it funny. That was my only concern. I was like, can I make, I, I think we can make a movie. I think we can make it funny. We had access to that cabin that we shot in. That's Lindsay's dad's cabin. Uh, Jimmy Hahn, who also composed the score for the movie. And we were like, we have a cabin. We had one, a very funky, weird, cool camera at a with a short film of ours in a film festival. I was like, so we have a camera. We have all our friends are actors because we grew up in L.A. <laughs> I was like, we so ensemble, cabin. And then we had made a talking napkin short film. Yeah. And that was really fun and funny. So I was like, all right, I think we could make a horror movie out of this. And I don't, I don't know how it came to a murder mystery top hat. Clue meets The Shining, but the tone <laughs> is live action Simpsons Treehouse of Horror, I think was sort of like the idea at the beginning. I, yeah. I don't know. I wish I had it. It's crazy. We're deranged, insane perverts. Maybe we're funny. Like, I hope Which so. deranged, insane pervert decided to call Seth Green? So he's a friend of ours, Lindsay and his wife, Claire. Claire is Seth's wife, who plays Kelly in the movie. She's very funny. She's from Memphis, so we sort of played up this like double life of her as yeah. being down home memphis -y person, which is her actual self with the sort of fake <laughs> self in the movie is the fake self. Uh, they met, I don't know, 12, 14 years ago or something like that in a UCB improv class and just became friends. And so then we're... They were friends with uh, Ashley. Claire and Ashley have been best friends for a really long time. And Christina. So Christina plays Carla and Ashley plays Diane. And then we brought in a couple of our friends. So it was just like this whole, like most of this was our, you know, Claire was a bridesmaid at, at the wedding. Most of this, yeah. was, Toby was a groomsman. Like this, most of this was just our like closest friends. And Seth happened to be around. And we didn't ask him to be in the movie because I didn't want Seth to think that we just were friends with him to get him in our weirdest possible movie <laughs> you know he's famous and we're not well and, and um, like maybe the weirdest role too like hey you're gonna be a bad guy and your top hat <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 so we want you to play a killer the voice of a killer top hat anyway after we were after we had shot the movie i did i showed rough spot at one point to claire and seth and was like do you know it would be cool do you want to voice one of these because i think seth he was like i want to be a part of it but yeah uh, yeah. we did, cool, we did. I kind of knew all along too I was like I had ridden Harry as you know he has the voice of it's kind of inspired by Skeletor uh, and um, you know Lindsay's doing like it's when Lindsay sort of starts to do that voice she had already been doing a Skeletor so when Seth was like what voice do you want me to do and I was like I know you got Skeletor yeah seen you do Skeletor a lot he does Skeletor on Robot Chicken and 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 just frequently in his daily life. So I was like, uh, just do Skeletor. And he was like, I got this. So now I know who's playing Skeletor in all the Family Guy episodes. And now I know. <laughs> Honestly, I, I hadn't thought about that, but I'm sure it's probably him. It's probably him. <laughs> uh, okay, so we have, of course, we have the napkin. Um, how do you develop these characters? Like with Woody and Sam and their interactions, how are you going to pull these characters out? Especially with them being your friends. It seems like that adds a layer of difficulty. Like, hey, you're meeting for the first time type of thing. I think it makes it a lot easier because I really, we really, the, the whole, it was very collaborative. Like mm -hmm. I had some semblance of a script very quickly, but there was, you know, early on, we did a lot of like improv games with where we got as much of the cast together as we could. And just like, all right, you're, you've discovered your snowman. Oh, oh, you found a body, go. Like, and what we both wanted to shape was like the story and like see what was funny and what worked. And, but more is like, everybody got to really sort of develop their characters and we got to see what was funny in the characters that interacted with each other. And then that led to a lot of like really fun, creative things we were able to do in the movie that 
you know, if you, you, you wouldn't get to do if you just like wrote a thing and then cast something. Because we yeah. did that. Yeah, you have strong opinions about it too, huh? Uh, like, <laughs> Ashley's character, Diane and Anthony, our friend Anthony's character who plays uh, Cliff. Like, it's not obvious that these two characters will be the ones who get to end up, you know, snowed into an ice shack together, which leads to this whole, like, she's going to save their marriage. She gives him therapy, this this very fun sort of surrealistic mushroom and psych, psychoactive therapy scene right yeah. and that only became because we saw that it when we were just messing around that anthony and ashley just incredible improv chemistry they're both great and funny and it was really funny to have those characters interacting with each other and in a room together so we were like let's yeah. make the story also go that way right like um yeah you got a strawberry <laughs> Am I just not listening to you? And that's a yeah. problem, huh? <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. I'm 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 on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of of the improv, it sounds like it was a big part of the creation of the film. Uh, do you have much improv in your background, or were you working with a lot of just improvers? Like I I, I have a little. Lindsay has a, a bunch. You know, everyone has some. Yeah. Well, like I like we're not like an improv troupe that does mm -hmm. has performed together, but everyone has, and like mostly what the cast is made up is like is you know people with real like who are really used to tv the pace of like working on a lot of tv shows and guest starring in yeah. tv shows and a lot of the sort of like fast thankless like you got to get this down you don't get so many takes yeah. um and like that makes them i'm thinking of jacob who plays sam and, and ashley who plays mm -hmm. diane like these are like working actors who are just really good they have very highly attuned instruments and they're very funny and so we really sort of built around like, well, we have them, they'll be funny. If they want to improv, they're going to improv. Like, yeah. There will be no stopping them. Uh, yeah. and, then, and Christina also did a ton, a ton of improv. Not everybody, because some people stuck to the script. Mm -hmm. Some people like sticking to the script more. I think I stuck to the script mostly because I wrote yeah. it, you know? But the best, all the best stuff in the movie is stuff that was not in the script is like, is all those, even this, I, I, I say this, but I think my favorite moment of Dr. Crane is an improv where Anthony is like, ah, I feel kind of shitty about giving that five bucks. And then Dr. Crane's like, Oh, I, I don't, I do not have it. <laughs> like that, the, just like a, it's like, it just feels very real. Anthony yeah. and I are friends, but I think it, it sort of feels like this brotherly moment that like the, the little micro tiny things that you discover when you're shooting and, you know, in those, I think, are the the things that ground what is otherwise such a zany, preposterous, absurd, big movie with yeah. all this multidimensional, you know, napkins. You can see this puppet strings nonsense. It, <laughs> I think it's good to swing it back and just have a lot of these just like little beats between people that that are I mean, that feel a lot more real. When you're doing that, when you're when you're improv, improv, improvising and you find the grounded moments. How do you recognize them in the moment? Are you too far into it? Uh, that, you find that in editing, I think. You just okay. try to shoot as much as you can. And then, yeah. you know, the, the first cut of this film, the, the script was 110 pages. And then the movie was three hours long. And, and then we, it, it took a really long time. We spent a really long time trimming and cutting to get the movie down to, you know, now it's like just under 90 minutes. It's like 80, 87 with credits or whatever. Yeah. Um, but that that was what that process was it was just like there's all like finding the right balance of these little moments that are just like that doesn't really advance the story but i like it it tells us something about the characters and, you know this is really important to the plot but it's not that funny is there another way of doing this better like yeah and so being, yeah so, so being open to those improv things you just you find that later i think yeah being a part of the entire process because you actually have seen it from start to finish <laughs> Uh, what do you think is the most rewarding and most challenging part of making the films? Okay, Mo most challenging, probably sound editing. I had to do that myself because really? that's expensive. Um, I don't think I did a, a great job, but I did a serviceable job for you know for doing it by, basically by myself. Um, no, the, the most challenging thing is is keeping up with the sort of like the you you sort of tell yourself a lot. Like, as I was like the cheerleader of this movie who was telling everybody, we're going to make a movie, we're going to finish a movie, it's going to be a real movie. And I did not know that. 
right? But I had to yeah. pretend to like a lot, my wife, my father-in-law, a lot of my closest <laughs> friends, some of whom are successful. Like um, I had to sort of be that cheerleader who was like, I have no doubt, right? Because there was no room for that. We got a soldier on. Um, that is, uh, you know, to keep that up over the years of developing, writing, shooting, and then editing, and then releasing, right? Like the other thing that's very rewarding, but also challenging that I have never done before is like the part about finding distribution, getting the movie out, promoting yeah. the film. Like that is a lot of work. I now have a tremendous amount of respect for the people who do that professionally. I, I, this was not a part of the industry that I knew is like the PR yeah. and the marketing and the, you just kind of know that that's somebody else's job as a, as a writer, right? Like yeah. you're on the other end of it usually. So when you're, when you get all the way here, I will take that and it will, it shapes the way I think of what projects to work on and how to work on them and how much I pour into them. And mm. I, I learned a lot about writing and doing all the other things. Writing the movie didn't teach me anything about writing. editing a movie, releasing a movie, promoting a movie that taught me about writing. Yeah. Probably told you like, where the budget needs to go. Uh, yeah. Stuff like that. That's probably a big, when you're a writer, you're imagining, oh, I want to create this world. When you're the producer, you're like, this world needs to cost this much. <laughs> you know? I mean, it, uh, yes. And also like, what are the, like, no matter, you know, I sort of went in with like, I'm just going to make this funny and as good as I can. And yeah. then, you know, when you get to the distribute, the, you're selling it to a distributor, you're trying to put this on platforms. Nobody's, no, at no point in any of that conversation is anybody talking about how funny your movie is, right? Like that's all mm -hmm. I cared about as a comedy writer. I was like, how funny is this movie? But at that point, the conversation was how much organic promotion on social media will Seth Green do for the film? And like, yeah. how do we sell this movie as a horror film? And how do we, what is the key art that sells the concept of the horror of it? And so, and not that any of, not that they're wrong. Like, I don't know. Like that is what yeah, the yeah. conversation is about your movie, but like, I made the movie to be funny, right? And, yeah. but it doesn't, you just have to hope that that helps the movie once people click on it, but people aren't, I don't know. The idea is people don't click on a movie because they think that it's got like, I don't, I don't, you don't, you can't sell a movie based on how funny it is, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe that'll change. I hope so. Because hopefully, yeah, it does feel like kind of a, a 90s, early 2000s things where it was just like the word would spread quickly, like, oh man, this is the funniest thing ever. People would go watch it. But now you have to like know the director, know the writer or know something about the movie ahead of time so much so that it kind of ruins it, frankly. Yeah. So with Hanky Panky out now, do you plan on expanding the Hanky Panky verse or do you have yeah. another project coming up? I mean, I can't help myself. I've written most of a second a, a sequel. All the, all the money that we were ever able to get will go into more blood, I think, and gore effects. That's the feedback okay. that we've gotten from... You know, we, we we had a really good time. We took the movie to we did a panel at Monster Palooza, which is a really fun convention. And like, I don't know, people seem to like or and the everybody who wanted to market it, the horror element over the comedy element. And I'm like, yeah. all right, we can well, I can do that. We can do more horror. We can do that costs a little bit of money. Like you can you can make fake blood, but you can't splatter it on everything for free. You, you know, if you're mm -hmm. gonna blow up a head in a scene. Whatever shirt that person's wearing, you gotta have like a hundred copies of that shirt. You gotta pay for yeah. that, so, you know. And there's rentals involved a lot of times and stuff like that. Yeah. It's, yeah. So that costs expensive. you know, geysers of blood shooting out of people's head cost money. You can't just do that at home or ruin the yeah, set. Note to self. Yeah. <laughs> so we've done that before. We made a short film. Lindsay and Toby and I and a couple of I think a couple of the other members of the Hanky Panky team worked on a short film called Nano Blood many 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 years ago that was a sci-fi horror drama short it's out there on the internet you can find it um we did there's a we blew up a head and we slit a throat and we we did all kinds of that kind of stuff in it and uh it was hard and it's expensive yeah oh yeah okay. we had to get actual special effects people to help us make prosthetics and stuff it was a whole thing it was much harder than Hanky Panky we were like I don't know just I don't know. Just put a. I mean, Toby designed those the the blood bags. It's just a Ziploc bag full of fake blood on the inside of a hat with a needle that sort of when you put it on squeezes it and then blood comes out. It works. Yeah. It did a great it job. Works. Yeah. But it didn't. It wasn't. It was not. Uh, it doesn't look tremendously expensive, and it wasn't. But it looks fun. I think that's the main thing. People need yeah. to go watch this. Uh, the trailer and all the links will be in the description, guys. But yeah, at least watch the trailer. It looks like it's a blast and you just want to kind of join in on the fun. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that I think if you if you get the comedy from the trailer, then the movie will deliver on the the promise oh of that comedy, right? And if you watch the trailer and you think this is this doesn't look funny, maybe maybe it won't be. I don't know, but yeah. give it a shot. But yeah. if but if the trailer's funny, you're gonna love this movie. That's cool. All right. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate that so much, Nick. There's so much mac and cheese on the laptop. <laughs> the timing is perfect. <laughs> of course. He's just been like all day. I've been in a writing session with a writing partner. He's just been hanging yeah. out. Hasn't He's just been sort of just chilling and then took too long a nap. And now he's just turned into a, 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 a mac and cheese demon who just wants to destroy <laughs> everything. And yeah. <laughs> Uh, where can people find you when they, if they want to keep up on the progress for the next Hanky Panky? Uh, at Hanky Panky Movie on all of the socials is the best place. Uh, okay. You know, we're on Instagram and Twitter and, and TikTok and all of that stuff. Uh, I'm not really on social media. Okay, uh, that's good for you. But I, the I movie, wish I could be and it's just me. I just I run most of it. Yeah. So. Okay. All right, guys. There's going to be links in the description. Make sure you click around. Start following up on everything. Again, Tubi, it's free with ads. And then you can watch the trailer. It's really good. One last geek related thing that I forgot that I should pitch is that for for those who are in the Dungeons and Dragons uh, mm -hmm. niche of geekdom, uh, I, I am as well. And I uh, am a DM and enjoy homebrewing things. And so, I, I, again, I can't help myself. Uh, I did design if you go to D&D Beyond, if you go to our a link tree, you'll get links to it. I did design some homebrew races for the hat and the napkin. If you want to if you want to create a character who is the hat. The hat folk or nap kind are, are races that I've built for, for 5e that are, uh, you know, they're very fun. Immediately, I had a friend test it out who was like, yeah, so I made a hat character and a napkin character. They've infiltrated an, un, a group of adventurers who don't know yeah. that they're uh, all other adventurers. You know, so it's, it's if you want a flying hat character with a brain soul sucking mechanism. And you want it on, and you use D&D Beyond, it's there. It's free. It's, it's whatever. Fun home I tell work. you what. So my, me and the co-host, and I'm the DM, of course I am. Uh, we have a session coming up, and I'm going to test them to see if they've listened to this interview. And they're going to be running into a bunch of loot that happens to be at a chest, and one of them will be a top hat. And so we're going to see how they yeah. do. It's a, it, yeah, you could definitely run like mimic vibes on it. That's what I'm thinking uh, is mimic, yeah. <laughs> I put some pretty good rules about, you know, the hat has to, you know, if it grapples you, it sucks your soul out, it gets a long raft out of that. It's a whole thing. You'll see. It's That's pretty cool. fun. There's some yeah. fun funs in there. I don't know why you're so upset, buddy. You just woke <laughs> up from that big nap. And you, I know. <laughs> Me too. All right. All right, Nick. I'll let you get back to to mac and cheese uh, <laughs> and all the chaos. Thank, Thank you so you. much for hanging out with me today, man. Thank you so much. And for putting up with all of this shenanigans. Oh, of course. It. Happy to. Let me know when the next one's coming out so we can have you back on and talk about the next one. Don't hold your breath. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> these things take these things take time. I'm hoping of to course. I'm gonna write it. I also have a third one. The third one's very fun. It's like Pinky Pinky Three hat trick. It's gonna be like apocalypse now. We gotta go to the hat realm and save all the spirits the that trapped up there. You know, <laughs> Dr. Crane's probably gonna make a comeback at some point. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that'd be great. Yeah. All right, guys, again, follow the links and we'll see you guys next time. Bye. <laughs>